in insufficiency and why is there this difficult fusion? <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to start by saying that we all practice medicine. We don't have the science of medicine. And uh, so I do measure 25-hydroxy-D in my patients. I do supplement them with vitamin D. And I'm now going to spend the next 20 minutes or so telling you that I'm not sure what levels we should be using, how we should measure it, and exactly what we should be doing. All right, so this is my disclosure, and the disclosure is that the vitamin D field is in chaos. I don't believe that anybody knows the right answer, and a fair amount of this is my opinion, and when you see the orange font color, you'll know it's my opinion. So why do we care? You just heard a nice discussion of uh, the reasons that we should be concerned about vitamin D, and uh, here are U.S. data that basically says, and you, this is using a conservative 20 nanograms per mil as the level to define low. The prevalence of low vitamin D is similar to obesity, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol. And based on the data that Professor Pavrajna just showed you, it's higher than that in Ukraine. So what? The so what is that this deficiency either is or is not causing lots of disease. And the reason that it could be is that vitamin D has local effects. And the bottom line here is that most of our tissues possess the 1 and the 25 hydroxylase to create active vitamin D. And it's therefore logical that if we don't have enough vitamin D, that could lead to dysfunction of multiple tissues and multiple cells, and therefore multiple diseases. And uh, as such, it's unsurprising that vitamin D deficiency has been associated with virtually every human disease. Association does not prove causation. We don't know that the low vitamin D status is causing these diseases. But if D deficiency is causing any of this, then vitamin D screening, supplementation, food fortification should be universal. I would want to know the 25-hydroxy D level in all of my patients. If D deficiency is not causing these diseases, then this is a huge waste of limited resources. So we need to figure this out. So the United States Preventive Services Task Force recently concluded, as you see here, the evidence on screening for vitamin D deficiency in asymptomatic adults to improve health outcomes is insufficient and that the balance of benefits and harms cannot be determined. This is not helpful to you as a clinician. This is not guidance. It basically says we don't. So the question then really is, what is vitamin D deficiency? And a second question is, why is there still confusion? There's been huge numbers of studies, huge amounts of money spent towards vitamin D research, why don't we have this figured out? And the reason, in my opinion, is as you see here, we have three huge problems. We don't really know what to measure, we don't know how to measure it, and we have issues with the randomized controlled trial designs. Now, the world accepts that 25-hydroxy-D is the way to define an individual's vitamin D status. As I told you before, that's what I use in my patients, that's what you use. And this was what the 2011 Institute of Medicine report came forward with. They said measure 25-hydroxy-D. 
to assess an individual's vitamin D status. Why? Why are we doing this? Because our mothers told us to, I guess. <clears throat> so, I, a couple of years ago, five years ago now, I had the opportunity to ask two of the people that I respect the most in the entire vitamin D field. The first was Professor Hector DeLuca. Professor DeLuca literally has over 1,000 vitamin D related publications on his CV. He's been in the field and remains active, but he started in 1955. And so I asked Hector about this and he said, well, there's a lot of it around. It's the most abundant of the vitamin D family in the blood and it's an easy assay. Well, it's not. And then he said, we probably should be measuring 125, but it's present in very small amounts and the assays aren't very good. Well, these are data from a year ago now from DQOTS, the Vitamin D External Quality Assessment Scheme. Uh, these are average data looking at a number of the assays here. And you can see that even with the average on these five sera, there's substantial variability in 25-hydroxy-D. So despite years of trying, 25-hydroxy-D measurement is still imperfect. And that's important when you're applying a rigid cut point of 20 nanograms or 30 nanograms or 12 nanograms, whichever one you like. When we have imperfect assays and we're applying rigid cut points, we have problems. The second expert I asked was uh, Professor Robert Haney. And uh, Professor Haney said, well, it seems to me that we need to measure not only 25, but we should also measure D3, or cholecalciferol. And that this is because D3 enters cells and its serum concentration might limit what the tissues can do. And he said, I don't think that we should be measuring 125, because that's a measure of calcium status. So my conclusion, after asking what I'm showing you is two of the world's experts, that we don't really know there isn't a good reason that we're using 25, but it's become the standard, and that's what we all use. And I often show this slide just to remind you that there is this huge array of vitamin D metabolites out there, and there's the one that we've decided to utilize to define our patient's vitamin D status. And some of these other metabolites possess vitamin D physiologic activity. So maybe we should be including them. Because we care about the vitamin D status of our patient, of that one individual. And it seems logical to me that including these other metabolites, if they contribute in a meaningful way to the actual vitamin D physiologic effect, that they should be included, not just single 25-hydroxy-D. So what might we consider, and I'm not going to go through this in any detail at all, <coughs> But there are data out there suggesting that the three epimer of 25 might be important, and not all of our assays measure that. 24-25-dihydroxy-D, the first presumed step on the degradative pathway of vitamin D, is present at fairly high levels, about one-tenth of the total 25, and that may have effects. And finally, as Professor Haney told us, cholecalciferol, and there may be others that we should be considering. Importantly, there's currently no direct way for you to determine if the vitamin D status of the patient that you're talking to is optimal. Now, if, if I'm low in thyroid and you're treating me with thyroid hormone, you can adjust that dose based on my TSH level. We do not have that yet with vitamin D. There is some work that suggests that the ratio of 25-hydroxy-D to 24-25 might be that indicator. And here's data from uh, Glenn Jones' lab. It basically looks a lot like the ratio of uh, PTH uh, of, uh, I misspoke, it looks like the PTH to 25-D ratio, but here it's 25-D to 24-25. And as we become deficient in 25, we stop 24, 24 hydroxylating, we stop the degradation. So that may be physiologically regulated. 
So there is a little bit of a push to measure this ratio, but there's no standardization of 24-25. And here's uh, DCLOS data from a couple of years ago now. These are, are the best labs in the world that are measuring 24-25 by HPLC, or by tandem mass spec. And look at the variability uh, in these uh, five samples between the labs. They're all over the map. And given that variability, it seems unwise to attempt to utilize this ratio at this point in time. I hear endocrinologists tell me all the time that I'll just measure PTH to define my patient's vitamin D status. Well, I'd remind you that there's huge scatter in PTH based on 25D. So look at, at uh, right here, 20, 25 nanograms per mil. Look at the PTH scatter at that same 25D level. You can't just use PTH. And importantly, the PTH assays are not standardized. Here was a small study that we did a few years ago uh, where we uh, sent uh, samples and 14 specimens to seven clinical laboratories around us and look at the PTH scatter. So I think that if you believe you can determine your patient's vitamin D status by measuring PTH, you're kidding yourself. So to summarize then, I believe that the field needs high quality assays for 25, for PTH, and at least for the three metabolites that I mentioned, the three epimer, polycalciferol, and 24-25. There's a lot of interest currently if we should or could even be measuring free or so-called bioavailable 25-hydroxy-D. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no tandem mass spec assay for free 25. And many of us have little to no confidence in the immunoassay for free 25. So, uh, in my opinion, we're really at the total cholesterol stage of lipid measurement. Back in the 1970s and 80s, we measured total cholesterol, and now the lipid panels are much more sophisticated. I think we're measuring the equivalent of that with 25-hydroxy-D. That is what I measure clinically. So it seems like the, given the massive amounts of data out there, we should be able to still figure this out. Big data should be able to, to sort through all of this. And here's a quote from Chris Sempos of the Vitamin D Standards Program that is important. Virtually none of the 25D data available for guideline development has used standardized 25-hydroxy-D and it matters. So here's just a small study from our group where we looked at 93 individuals who were highly sun exposed and we used three good assays. We used a tandem mass spec assay, we used an HPLC assay, and then we standardized it. And you can see the distribution varies depending on the method, the mean varies depending on the method, and because the meta-analyses don't take these assay differences into effect, none of the meta-analyses that use 25-hydroxy-D are helpful. So all of these meta-analyses, and we're publishing a meta-analysis in vitamin D about every 36 hours, none of those are helpful. How about the large ongoing randomized control trials? Certainly that will resolve the chaos regarding D deficiency. Unfortunately, no. Large fatally flawed trials yield flawed conclusions, in my opinion. Here's an example of one. This is the vital trial that was published this year in the New England Journal and concluded that vitamin D was not important in cancer or cardiovascular events. This was 25,000 people, millions of U.S. dollars, and fatally flawed. Bob Haney told us this seven years ago in this New England Journal editorial, and uh, he said the question of how much vitamin D is enough is going to remain muddled as long as meta-analyses focus on trial methodology rather than biology. What did he mean? 
And uh, I think this is a wonderful review. I think for those of you who are doing vitamin D <coughs> clinical trials, it should be required reading. It's Haney Nutrition Reviews 2013. And he basically said this is how you should design and analyze your trial. And he based it upon this curve that is the relationship of a nutrient intake to the biologic response. And what he said was that if the basal status is deficient, then an increase in intake will produce benefit. That makes sense. <coughs> and if the nutritional status is replete, then giving more of that nutrient probably won't produce a benefit. And finally, if the nutritional status is high, giving more can only produce toxicity. And then he went on to say that this point is so obvious from inspection of the curve that you thought it would go without saying. But most or all of our clinical trials are recruiting people from up here. They're not deficient in the nutrient. And if you're not deficient in vitamin D, and I give you more of that, I cannot possibly benefit you. And so vital, for example, where the average 25-hydroxy D uh, level at baseline was 29 nanograms per mil, that study was going to be negative. Additionally, the studies don't recognize the radical concept that we are not all the same. Why should you and I have the same requirement for any nutrient? That seems very unlikely. And in fact, the 25-hydroxy-D increase to a fixed dose varies dramatically. And these are women who took roughly 2,500 international units daily for six months and they started in, on the black <coughs> diamonds, they finished on the open circles. Look at the huge difference in response, despite the fact that they reported taking over 90% of their daily vitamin D supplement. This is probably due to differences in absorption and differences in volume of distribution and degradation. A treat to tar target approach seems logical, but hasn't been done in the RCTs. They pick a dose, give it to them. So, why we haven't figured this out is we don't know where the subjects started, we don't know where they ended, and we haven't used standardized measurements. So in my opinion, the so-called evidence is flawed, and that leaves us clinically practicing medicine and applying common sense. And uh, my version of common sense is that you and I are basically the same way we were when we were hunter-gatherers. And uh, people have published this for years, and that suggests that we could use the hunter-gatherers to tell us how much of a nutrient is enough. And for vitamin D, that means that we were supposed to be making vitamin D when we're outdoors, like these individuals here, oops, who are the few hunter-gatherers on the planet, uh, they went into Tanzania and recruited a small number of these folks. Their mean 25-hydroxy-D was 46, and nobody was below 23 nanograms per mil. Uh, this was our little surfer study from uh, about 15 years ago now, and with a standardized assay, we retrospectively standardized the 25-D assay, so it's comparable to the CDC results, 36 nanograms per mil was what the average was. So, what to do clinically? Uh, I think that if you're a believer in 20 nanograms per mil, recognize that there's assay variability and shoot for 30. If you're a believer in 30, shoot for 40. That's not going to put you into the toxic range. For many of our patients, that means one or two or 4,000 units per day. So, uh, to summarize then, uh, we are using 25D to define vitamin D status, but recognize that in the trial, standardization is rarely done. In my opinion, the meta-analyses that consider 25-hydroxy-D as equivalent, regardless of the assay, are fatally flawed. <coughs> 
There's still a huge amount of controversy, and this is going to continue. The large RCTs, I think, are not going to resolve it. Uh, and uh, they, because of that, they, they will not resolve it because they were designed to be negative trials. And the only thing that they can do is cause toxicity. So, what do we do clinically? I think it's reasonable to supplement older adults with osteoporosis, muscle weakness, falls, and prior to having orthopedic surgery. I believe that the ancestral value of roughly 40 nanograms per mil is a reasonable target, and that requires one or 2,000 IUs as a place to start. I didn't discuss this, but I believe that daily dosing makes physiologic sense. We were designed to live outdoors and make a little bit of vitamin D every day, not get intermittent large doses of vitamin D. I think a way potentially out of this is to retrospectively standardize 25-hydroxy-D, and that can be done relatively inexpensively if adequately <coughs> stored serum aliquots exist. And doing so would allow us to pool data from the large RCTs to select people who were low before we started and therefore might have benefit. And hopefully that will allow us to define what low actually is and what diseases it causes, and I thank you. Thank you indeed. Are you now more confused after the lecture? <laughs> questions or comments? Or? Questions. The next presentation.